Hey folks, welcome back to the Speaker Builder channel. Uh, I have a, a project upgrade I'm doing today and I want to uh, share that with you all. These are the active speakers that I built a couple of years ago. And uh, my intention with these was to achieve a very high level of sonic clarity. And I don't know that I was ever very happy with uh, ever having achieved that high level that I was after. So I'm here doing an upgrade to try to uh, get a little closer to that, to get another notch closer. If you'd like to see, this is a five-part video series on these speakers. I talk all about 8-inch 2A design. I talk about the vented alignment. I talk about active versus passive. I show you the active crossover. So I'm not going to cover any of those details here. You can check out those videos to, uh, to learn about this system if you want. Here I'm just going to talk about upgrades, and there's a couple of important changes I'm going to make with this system that's going to bring me up a little bit higher up to the closer to that high level of clarity I was after. So first change we're going to make is uh, that I have made has been to uh, place the vent in the front of the cabinet. So let me talk about my thinking about why I was placing the vent on the back side of the box. And I began doing that a couple of years ago with all my vented alignments. I was placing the port at, at a, a back panel. I was not putting it any longer in front. Historically, I always put the vent in the front panel. But so I got it in my head that it belonged on a back panel, and I'm going to explain why that is, where, where that thinking came from. So if we think about uh, uh, vented alignments, this is a large vented alignment, 8-inch driver and a 40-liter box. The vented alignment calls for that particular box volume and for a vent of a particular diameter and a ported with a particular length to it. So that's the design. So we put the port somewhere in this box, right? And uh, historically, oh, I always put it in front. My thinking a couple of years ago uh, was, and maybe I've been thinking too hard about this, but uh, the idea was that it's potentially a problematic to have the driver and the vent on the same panel, both facing into the listening uh, area. And the reason why is if we slow down time for a minute, and watch this driver producing positive waves and then negative waves and then positive and then negative. Uh, don't pull too much on your speaker cones when you do it. I, I'm doing it for the sake of the video, but really never should never, we never need to move the cone, right? So just a kind of a, a, a caution there. But anyway, so I can do it a little bit. I'm gonna be careful here, not, not, not uh, damage the voice coil, but. So producing these positive and negative waves then, will produce opposite waves inside the cabinet. So as I produce a negative wave in the environment, it's producing a positive wave inside the cabinet. That positive wave will come through the port and out into the listening area. So as a driver is trying to produce a negative wave, you're gonna be producing, uh, consequently, a positive wave at the same time out into the listening area, potentially. And that those two waves, a positive coming from the vent and a negative from the driver will cancel each other out, right? And uh, conversely, when it creates a positive wave, it'll produce a negative wave at the vent. And so you can get this, these waves, uh, positive and negative, canceling each other out. That wouldn't happen at all frequencies, but at some frequencies, it could potentially happen, right? So that was my thinking that, gee, maybe it really doesn't belong. I'm gonna get it beginning all these cancellations. Even though, historically, I've always had the vent in front and, it, and the bass reflex uh, sound always was awesome. I've always been very pleased with the bass response, the sonically how good it sounded. So I started putting the vent in the, the you know the back of the cabinet or someplace else, and that's what that's where I was when I built these uh, speakers. So the story that led me to challenging that was the uh, experience I had replacing the bass drivers in my top of the mountain speaker system, and I did a video on that as I do on everything, and so you can check those video that video out. It's called uh, Bass Speakers. And in that video, I replace the uh, old $50 12-inch uh, drivers with these $185 SB bass drivers in my top of the mountain speaker system. The big, th they're also five-sided, but a big uh, three cubic foot boxes. And the vent had, I had moved to the back of that cabinet and I never got the bass to sound right in that system. It, was, it just didn't work at all. And I was very disappointed having spent all that money on those drivers. So I finally went back to Matta Sound called them up and said, what in the world is the deal with the vent? Does it belong in the front or the back of the cabinet? Maybe that's what the problem is. And sure enough, they come back, oh no, Jeff, put the vent in the front of the cabinet. Uh, same, same plane with the driver. That will sound best. 
So I did that. I changed the vent around, and oh my gosh, it made a huge difference. The bass sounded wonderful, finally, because the $50 drivers always sounded kind of okay, but these $185 SB drivers, they ought to sound really awesome. Well, now they do. They sound amazing. I've been so impressed with that that I've decided there's probably uh, an improvement that I can make with these speakers by putting the vent up front. So I've done that here. I put the vent already, moved it, and I had to seal off the, the uh, hole in the back of this cabinet so that uh, it's sealed again. So the vent belongs up front, so always I got to do a video on that and just talk about uh, vented alignments and putting the vent up front. Now I'll, I'll comment on that, how, how whether the bass sounds really better with the vent up front at the end of this video. I haven't heard it yet. But anyway, that's the first change I made to this system and that, I've want, that I wanted to do since I got the bass speakers to sound so good in the other system. Uh, the second change had to do with uh, the speaker wire. Now I did a video on speaker wire uh, recently and uh, one of the things that I discovered uh, let me grab that speaker cable. This is the, uh, and you can go to that speaker video, it's called Speaker Wire, and uh, check out what I, uh, I talk about this wire and some of the other cables I have. This is the FT4 wire that I used for this project. And I had one run of this for the tweeter, and then I doubled up the run. I doubled it for the base mid driver, for the 8-inch driver, because my thinking was that there wasn't very many very much copper here, very much wire here, probably sufficiently adequate for the tweeter, but I thought maybe I would need to double it up for the bass mid driver because I want to produce a lot of bass and my experience has been running heavy, heavier speaker cable for bass improves the bass response. So I doubled it up. Now I did go to uh, the guys at uh, AudioQuest who make this and they said, oh Jeff, don't worry about it, run just a single run for the bass driver. Well, I doubled it up anyway, and that's a lot of money. It's two and a quarter per foot, $2.25 a foot. So doubled up 10 feet, that's 20, 20, 40 feet of cable just for the base mid drivers. Well, in the speaker uh, wire video, I tested out those ideas and I had never done that before. And so what I did discover, first of all, was that this FT4 wire sounds the best in high frequency response. And so it is an excellent choice for the tweeter. So I'm gonna remain with this wire for the tweeter using this wire to wiring up my high frequency driver. And then doubling it up, I discovered in that other video, uh, did not make any difference in the bass. In fact, the bass didn't sound best with this wire. It sounded better with heavier core wire, multi-strand, heavy core multi-strand, like 12 gauge multi-strand wire, like the Monster Cable, or that was acoustic research cable, I think the 50 cents a foot cable. That sounded better in the bass than my FT4 wire. So now the other wire I have is this Megami, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in on this and, talk, and, and show you that, just let me do that. So this, this is Mogami wire and it has a, I don't know if you can see that, it has a coax on the outside and then you pull those strands back and you have this uh, center uh, insulator uh, core with wire in the inside. So it's a kind of a, a coax lead. So one of the issues is uh, when you run this wire, you don't truly, I mean, it's probably as many wire strands here as here in the core, but it's not truly a balanced line. And so one of the ways around that to fix that is to double it up and have two of these and run the center core for the plus and the outer one for the other one as plus and then run the, you know, the other core, the other center and the other core for the minus. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I'm gonna show you that with these. Uh, that's one change and then I have these, uh, these really cool uh, these cool insulators because you see that wire could cross over. So I've got these insulators, they're called uh, pants, uh, wire pants. And it's kind of kind of because it has, you know, like two legs in its center, but it keeps these from, from uh, touching each other. And the other, and so now you have, you can see it's uh, the insulator is bulging out. You can see that a little bit in the video, how that bulges a little. So that's the plus, uh, that's the one of the ends. And then you, if you're gonna run two of them, you run them, but you run them opposite. And I've already marked these with some white paint, a white uh, marker. But this will be the, uh, let me see if I can get this, uh, I can do this. So in the white here, this one will be the outer core for one, and this will be the inner core 
for this other cable. And so you put those together for your plus and then the outer inner and outer cores opposites for your minus. So anyway, you run them double and it, and it gives me more speaker cut wire and it uh, gives me a balance line. Now maybe the balance line wouldn't be so important if it were just doing bass, maybe it wouldn't matter. But in this case, uh, these cables are gonna run, because this is an eight inch two-way system, it's gonna run low frequencies all the way up to 2000 cycles. So I'd want that balance line. I did uh, change out from a single to a balance line way back in the day with my passive uh, uh, speaker, satellite speakers that I had. And I didn't notice any change in clarity of performance, but I did notice improvement in imaging. And so there was a slight change. Anyway, so that's my idea. I have this cable left over from other projects. So I'm gonna run these cables now. So, I, uh, so I'm running the double, the dual, co the, the, the double dup wire of coax uh, Mogami cable. This is, uh, I'll tell you what this is, 3082, Mogami 3082 wire. You can still get this stuff. And then on the, on the other side, of course, I'm using these, uh, these plug-in connectors. You put the wire in, you get a nice cast, gas type connection, and then you can plug that into your amplifier. Or you can use amplifiers I have, have their own uh, connectors like this that you can screw down the wire onto the wire. Now for the driver, let me zoom in on this and I'll show you the, what I did with the driver. So with the drivers, what, what, they, what they come with is these kind of connectors and especially on the other side, they're very small. See, they're kind of small spades. And you're supposed to solder a big chunk of cable onto that small spade and that's really problematic. It's, challenging to do. I don't like, we don't like the soldered connection. We have to avoid that. And they're so small anyway. And now I'm trying to run big heavy speaker cable onto this. So one of the workarounds is to you, you buy these at, at Parts Express and they are, they are uh, press on, push on connectors. And they, when you push them down, they open up the hole. Maybe you see that in the video. They open up the hole and you stick the wire through and then they're spring loaded and they come back and press onto the wire and hold the wire in place. Uh, the nice thing is over time, they, as they, the wire might fatigue, you know, get collapsed, the, the spring will continue to hold adequate tension on those. So anyway, they're only a couple bucks a piece. I don't know how much they are, but... And these, these speakers happen to have a screw that held these down already. And so I was able to remove the screw and then just screw these others on because they had a hole in the middle already. So those are the couple changes I made for the, for the speaker wire. We're gonna use this instead of the Mogami doubled up. And we're going to uh, put the pants on to the cables to make that nice. And then we added the for the base. So that's all about uh, all the changes on the base that I've made. Now let me talk about the high frequency drivers and the challenges I had there. Now I did a video on tweeters and in that video I talk about these and I talk about the uh, I bought some other drivers. I was trying to test out uh, different tweeters to see how they would sound against these and against my uh, Focal tweeters that I have in the top of the mountain system. I had never gone to that trouble before, so I went to that trouble. I was thinking about rebuilding this project and uh, just exploring high frequency drivers generally. These are the drivers I ended up with. I started out with the CAS $50 piece uh, metal dome tweeters. I think they were magnesium, aluminum, alloy, cones, uh, elements. And then I those didn't work out very well, and I went to these. Uh, these are the uh, Audax, magnesium, uh, I think these are, I'm sorry, titanium dome tweeters, 100, 110 bucks a piece or something. And uh, so they're really nice, but they're a little bright, they're a little crisp, they're a little harsh on the ears in an active system. These would be great in a passive speaker. I'll target these for a passive speaker someday. So I tried out those uh, uh, Morel drivers. You go look at the tweeters project. I had the Morel drivers, I had purchased them, I showed those in that video. I wasn't very happy. Those are soft dome tweeters. I wasn't very happy with those. Prior to doing that video, I had bought these very same drivers. These are the uh, Etons. Eton makes these uh, ceramic coated titanium dome tweeters. Uh, pretty elaborate stuff, pretty expensive. These are 140 bucks a piece. The other ones are 200 bucks a piece, but these do have the clarity of my Focal tweeters. They don't have a 
brightness at the top end like the like the uh, Audax tweeters do. So they have a nice neutral sound as far as no peaks or anything. So that's my 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 challenge here is to try these out to see how these are neodymium magnets and so they're not very they're not very big. Now the challenge I had with putting these in is that uh, let me go up on the cabinet and show you that. So these holes I had modified already once because I had put the SP drive uh, rather the CAS drivers in there and then changed out and changed my mind and went with the uh, the Audax tweeters. So I had to make a different, you know, had to change the hole around a little bit. Then I'm gonna, now I'm going to change the tweeter again. So while an active system provides for the flexibility to put different drivers in, you don't have a passive crossover that dictates the type of driver, right? But now you've got a different hole pattern, and this is a smaller tweeter. And so the problem was to get this mounted in here. It wouldn't mount in here. I'd have to cover this over, put a plate on here. I, I thought about different things. So these plates, this steel plate, was from a tweeter that I used in a different project. And so I was able to cut that steel plate out. It's actually an aluminum tweeter plate. I was able to cut the plate out and then mount this tweeter onto that steel plate, uh, aluminum plate rather. And I already had the holes from, from that tweeter. Mount this on here and now I have a, a larger hole for mounting these tweeters on there. So they're gonna go right on like that. That was a project, that was a challenge to get these tweeters mounted on here and how I was gonna do that because they didn't fit anymore. The holes were a mess. And I don't have a nice a way of routing this and then putting a new plate in here. And so there were a couple different solutions I was looking at, but that was my best solution to take those aluminum plates from other tweeters, cut them, create a ring basically mount these inside that aluminum ring repaint them nice flat black they were a gloss flat but i had to paint them black and then hit them with gloss paint to make them look nice but anyway so that's how i how i solved that problem so those are the upgrades to uh this project uh so let me go ahead and put these together today and then i will uh maybe tomorrow or something i'll pull the camera out and put it into uh, i'm gonna break, put this system into the living room and play it and uh, see how they sound and then we'll make further comments at the end so here are the speakers all assembled, and I've set these up in my living room. And uh, let me orient you first of all. Uh, this is the active two-way speaker system, the, the speaker boxes themselves, and this little cheapy wooden cabinet that I made that holds the two amplifiers, the control amplifier, and the electronic crossover on top there. So that is setting, that entire system is setting in front of what I call the top of the mountain speaker system, which is in back along the wall. The satellite, you see the one on the right, the satellite is sitting on top of the base speaker on both sides. You can't see the other one on the other side, it's blocked, but, and the cabinets and include all the amplifiers in the back along the wall there. So the reason I've set the system up in here, and I certainly wasn't gonna move all that other stuff out of this room, but I, my ears are used to hearing the top of the mountain system, which is my reference point. Uh, not not only generally but for this system in particular i've been trying to emulate that top of the mountain system so my ears are used to hearing that system in this room and so i wanted to hear this now uh, this upgrade to this eight inch 2a system in this room so that i could really do an a b comparison uh, it is true you know every system will have a little bit different a sound if it's in a different room and so you might try that take your speaker system if it's not too much work and put it into a different room and see what it sounds it sounds different and the reason for that is you're not just hearing from the drivers, but you're hearing reflections from the room. And whether you have like soft carpet and soft furniture, or whether you have hard walls or hard floor, it's going to change the characteristic of the sound of your system. So, and every room is going to sound a little different. Anyway, so my ears are used to this room, so I know what I'm after. So putting it in here, it gave me that ability to compare to the top of the mount, which is what the whole point was here, right? to uh, try to emulate that super clean system in a, in, a, in a less complex kind of a design. The other reason was that I had my CD player and my turntable on the back wall there. Through that control amplifier, it's all hooked up, ready to go. So all I did is I pulled the wires, the, the input lines, out of the uh, control amplifier that would normally feed to the, the uh, electronic crossover in the back system. And I've just, you can might see them I don't know if you can see them in the video, but a couple of cables are coming in and, and uh, are plugged into my electronic crossover up front here. So now the signal is going through that, 
through that control amplifier. I think this is a good comparison. My control amplifiers don't color the sound too much, so whether I use the more expensive one in back or this one in front wouldn't matter. But it was just for simplicity's sake. Everything's plugged into that control amplifier, and so I don't have to make too many changes. But anyway, so I'm, uh, let me give some general comments first off. Uh, I was, uh, my original intention was to build a system that would be incredibly clean and emulate this incredible clarity that I, that I hear in my top of the mountain system. And for about half the money, basically, it's about 2,500 bucks in this uh, eight inch two-way system, I got a 5,000 or more in the top of the mountain system. So I would say that I have definitely accomplished that finally with this upgrade. I, I didn't feel that way before with the old tweeters and so forth. So I definitely have arrived. Uh, I would be very, very happy with this speaker system if this is all that I ever had. If I have another, had another house, you know, get a cabin in the mountain somewhere, I could just bring this system and I could be very, very happy with it. It's really impressive. Now, because I know the top of the mountain system, I know what it sounds like. I have on a couple of occasions in the past week, uh, listening to something that I really wanted to hear, exceptionally clean, I had to pull these speakers out, put the satellites back up and set the top of the mountain system back in place and make it work and to listen to that piece of music. So there is definitely a difference. Well, obviously there's a huge difference in cost is half the money of the top of the mountain system. So this kind of a system does uh, sort of prove the point that you get what you pay for. And I put a lot of, you know, $2,500 is not cheap money. And uh, especially the tweeters I mentioned that I've replaced here, 140 bucks a piece. But everything has been worthwhile. The, 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 the clarity of this stuff is absolutely phenomenal. Now, I hope you all understand, you know, folks are saying, uh, uh, somebody said on one of the videos, Jeff, you're talking too much. I need to hear the system. You all I hope you all understand why I'm not auditioning this system through my videos, right? Anything that you might hear in this room, in order to send it into you through YouTube, I'd have to record it with a microphone, and that's going to change the character of the sound. And then you're going to be listening to what this system might sound like through your speakers in your system. And so those, those speakers are going to determine what the sound is like, right? That's the whole point of building speakers is that it gives you good, clear, clear sound. The only way you could hear what this sounds like is you'd have to have your own system at home like this and then play, you know, uh, source music through a CD or a record or something. I wish that I could, there are a whole bunch of you are subscribed. I wish I could, I could invite each one of you into this room and sit you down and let you hear what this sounds like. And the other thing is you gotta have a, you gotta have a reference point too. I'm listening to this and I'm amazed at how clean it is, but I've had other people I've brought in here and they don't hear it. It's like they don't have ears because they haven't been chasing after high quality sound and they haven't made all these comparisons and they haven't chased and tried to figure out what good sound is and taken a real critical ear to all that. So having done that, you just have to trust me, I've been doing this for decades. This is an amazing system. So if you really want an awesome sound, but again, 2,500 bucks is not cheap money. I'll go through the cost. The control, the, uh, the electronic crossover, well, let me start with the control amplifier. That's where the source is. Going back to the CD player, it's a $500 CD player. So, and then through the control amplifier, this is a $500 one. This, the old one that's in this system, three or $400. I think you're not gonna be able to find a control amplifier for less than 500 bucks. And then the, uh, t then the bass amp was probably five, six hundred dollars and the tweeter amp was for four or five hundred dollars. The electronic crossover I built were only 150 bucks, but a lot of work there. So you're talking five thousand, fifteen, two thousand dollars just in components. And then you probably spend a couple hundred bucks on the drivers and then you have to build the boxes. So nothing here is cheap. And so, you know, uh, you get you do get what you pay for. But it's just phenomenal. I wish you could uh, I wish you could hear this. I wish you could enjoy this and appreciate it. One of the things that I would say um, is that the tweeters they, I think I like these tweeters better than the Focals that are in the back. If you see the, the satellite sticking out in the back and the bo and on top of the base, the eight inch, the 12 inch bases, base boxes back there with a the 12 inch driver in it, the satellite sits on top of that. Those are the Focal drivers or Focal tweeters. I think I like these Etons better than the Focals. And so I'm looking now at buying the more expensive Etons 
building another pair of satellites to replace my top of the mountain satellites. That's another project maybe for next summer, next fall when I have $800 a drop because that's what it's going to cost to build new satellites. But anyway, so just phenomenal. Let me go through and to try to emphasize, you know, why does this system sound so clean? Well, it just comes down to every step in the signal path is exceptionally clean and that's what you have to do. So starting with the CD player, you have I have a $500 Rotel. It's not the most expensive CD player on the planet, obviously, but it's pretty darn clean and pretty nice. Going through that into a control amplifier. Control amplifier is just a switching device and an attenuation device. Doesn't I don't think it colors the sound that much. I couldn't hear much difference between these two in the past. But so you're coming through that, and then you're going through. This is uh, Audio Quest a Ruby. You can't get the Ruby anymore, but Audio Quest input cables. You spend hundreds of dollars on those. But you gotta get, if this is, this audio cable coming from the control amplifier into the electronic crossover carries the full bandwidth, right? So you wanna spend some money there on a good, on a good uh, set of input cables. Going into your, to your electronic crossover, then this is the uh, crossover components I got from Phil March and it's 24 dB per octave, Linkwitz Riley circuit, a high end stuff. It's got its own power supply and its own little plug-in stuff there. Uh, Phil Marchand makes really high quality stuff, so check out, that's uh, marchandelec.com, I think it is. Check out his stuff, but that's where all those parts come from. I talk about that a little bit more, and I show you inside what that looks like in the original video series on the called Active Speakers, so you can check that out. Now, coming out of that, I have some actually home-built uh, uh, input cables that are going from the electronic crossover to the different amplifiers. It's micro, it's four lead microphone cable. I talk about that in the other video as well. Then I'm going to the base amp. Let's talk about the signal path to the base. This is a 100 watt per channel uh, Rotel amp. Big toroidal power transformer. Each, each, cha each channel of the two channel amplifier the, to the right and to the left has its own pair of coupling capacitors. So it's, everything's just done right. It's just high end the way they built it, uh, a, a class AB, I believe. And then coming out of that, I, you know, I showed you the speaker cable. I'm doubled up the uh, Mogami 3082. So that's real high end going directly into the drivers. There's no, uh, no cup on the back of these boxes. The cables go directly into the box and, 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 uh, and they're hooking directly onto my new connectors for the base drivers I showed you. So that's real high end all the way through. The signal path is high end all the way through to these base eight inch base drivers with giving me a, an F3 down in the low 30s. And then a big, huge box, 40 liter box. It's, you know, large vented alignment. Now the ports are up front, vented, you know, the, the, the uh, flared ports, you know, the five sided box design. I'll demonstrate that next summer, uh, the project to, to compare five-sided box to a cube shape. Uh, somebody's challenged me on that. I want to do that project another time. But uh, And then I've insulated inside the box. You should put something against the walls. So this is half-inch uh, carpet padding, just like what's on the, what's on the floor here, underneath the carpet. It's this half-inch padding. It's a very thick, dense material. You cut into the strips and glue it onto the different panels of the five-sided box. Everything is, everything is maximized all the way through from front to back. The entire single path has been maximized for the bass. So the bass sounds phenomenal. And then on the high end, I'm going through, I've carefully selected this Rotel 1050 amp. I have three Rotel amplifiers, all 50 watts a channel of different ages and different models. And they all sound different, radically different, hooked up to tweeters, either top of the mountain or these. Either way, I could go, I could go do that. And so that's interesting that amplifiers sound so different, especially in the high end. Uh, but so this one is the cleanest of the three, phenomenally clean, same amplifier I'm using in the top of the mountain speaker system. So I know this amplifier is clean. I bought it used on eBay and uh, to, to include in this system. So I've spent that money to uh, coming out of the electronic crossover into that amp and then out through the FT4Y, which I've now demonstrated. Check a look at, uh, take a look at the uh, speaker wire video, I tested four sets of speaker wires and I demonstrated that this FT4 wire was the cleanest. And so that's the wire we're using to go into the tweeter. And then of course that cable doesn't have a, ca a cup and a, a separate connector at the back of the speaker box. The cable is going into the box directly soldered to the connectors in the speaker. 
on the tweeter drivers. So that signal path is super clean. And then, of course, these tweeters being, uh, I believe they're magnesium, ceramic coated magnesium diaphragms. But they're just highly specialized. They sound wonderful. They're not as bright and as brilliant as the Focals, and I like them better than the Focals. So they're just phenomenal, they're just phenomenal. This system, other than the fact that it doesn't produce the same amount of power, of course, that my, my you know, at top of the mountain system does, because I don't have a 130 watt channel amp, I don't have 12 inch base drivers, you know, it's eight inch drivers are just not going to produce the magnitude of power that you can get if you have a set of 10s or a set of 12s, right? Just can't get that much power. I can make this room, fill this room with sound, so it's not like the system, you can't turn it up. But I did have a recording I was listening to this week, and I had a kick drum, and kick drum was going boom, boom, and those drivers were bottoming out. I was exceeding X max on these drivers. And I didn't have it that loud, and so there's just a volume limit when you have an eight inch two-way system. It's very satisfying, it sounds wonderful, but if you really wanna really make your ears bleed or something, really make it sound like there's a band in the room, which I sometimes I like to do, you can't do that with this eight inch two-way. It just doesn't have, you know, this is a fairly large room, almost 200 square feet, and so I can fill the room so that it's hard to talk to the person next to you, but it doesn't, doesn't do what the top of the mountain system does, right? So it's a compromise to do with eight inch two-way. There's something, I will say this, is some, there's, there's a specialness about having just two drivers in each, in each cabinet. There's a specialness to the clarity of that. That's really nice, and you can't do that if you get 10s or 12s, you end up with three-way, right? So that's, again, another compromise, but phenomenally clean. You know, limited power, but phenomenal. Just, I just wish you all could share and experience this and get used to it, and then go back to your old systems and say, oh my gosh, you know. So I wish I could share that. So the only way to do that is you gotta build your own. I've shown you what I did here. There's a couple of things you could do different. Uh, instead of building a five-sided box, you could build a, like, a, a, emulate a three-sided box. Basically it has a single panel up front that it would be, have to be nine inches wide, like these. But then instead of having the other panels this way and then that way, five-sided, you just turn these panels in and have it go this way. So it's almost like a three-sided. So that if you turn it on its end, it's a, it's a front panel and then the back panels and then another back panel. So it forms like almost a triangle. And then the very back panel is very, very short, very narrow. It would actually be four-sided, but the the, the sides, and I'm looking at this box stand up on its end, right? I'll have to, I wanna design one of these, maybe I'll do that video someday, but the side panels, if my hands can emulate side panels, would not be parallel. And there would be no, almost no parallel wall between the front panel and a, and a very narrow back panel. There'd be virtually no parallel wall. So that's, a, that's an alternative design. If you'd make it that way, there's less volume in the, uh, in the circumference of the box, so then your box could could uh, extend all the way to the floor. And so it would be a virtually a tower speaker. And I have an idea in my head to build a tower speaker with an eight inch two-way design. It would be kind of fun. I might get to that someday, but that would be an alternative. I like the five-sided shape, but I think this uh, alternative that I came up with uh, in the past couple of weeks would, that I've just talked about would be kind of cool because it would be a, like a tower speaker it would extend to the floor. I did shorten these uh, stands. These are uh, home-built stands, uh, and I just bind them together and painted them black. And they are, and they just used uh, uh, two sets of screws on the top and two sets of screws from the bottom. You know, the stand is basically two panels and then two vertical panels, right? You can see that in the stands that these are sitting on. And they're just screws that, that screw in. You have to pilot drill the, the MDF. It's MDF in the middle, the vertical ones. And they will split if you just pump a screw into them. So you pilot drill them, but uh, pre-drill them. But anyway, you can just take them apart. And I, and I was able to take them on the saw and shorten them six inches. The tweeter needed to be 35 inches off the floor. So they were 41 with the stands the way they were. So I shortened the stands down so they're down a little lower, but it would be cool, you know, as I say, to build a, a tower speaker that would extend all the way to the floor. So that's about it for uh, the uh, review of this system. Uh, please uh, feel free to comment and uh, we'll uh, see you all next time.